the African children, talking about their African problems and finding those critical, critical African solutions. Here we are, 2024, and we have begun to see an interesting tide and movement around the continent, particularly when it comes to uh, the issues of governance. Uh, we've just uh, finished up the elections in South Africa. We also have witnessed within this season the takeover of power in Mali, the uprising that has happened in Burkina Faso, in Somalia, and in some of the ECOWAS countries. And while we are still excited about that, uh, boom, Kenya comes onto the, onto the table uh, with a total revolution uh, in the spirit of Mau Mau. The young people are confident and they are sure they are tired of uh, this whole concept and principles of managed neo-colonialism, particularly when it comes to financial stability, welfare of the Africans, the sharing of resources for the African children. And we want to stand with the young people that are in Kenya. And as they are leading the way, uh, I think it's less than four, five, six, seven years ago, when, when Ghana's uh, ruling party lost its uh, power to the opposition party, and uh, Kenya is now coming down. And if you can follow carefully also, our revolution moves like that, and just takes you to observe that uh, the Nkwame Nkrumahs, when they started off in, uh, in Ghana, Ghana being the first country to be independent, then from Ghana it moved over to to Kenya and the Mau Mau and the Tanzania, Chama Chama Pindusa. Then we come down to, uh, to Zambia. We also come down to uh, Zimbabwe, Chimurenga, then Namibia, then South Africa. So South African context in terms of liberation, they will catch up, but they will catch up quite later on. But uh, what we see happening in, in, in Kenya is not just a drop in the bucket. It is... Um, a surgeons, it's a new energy that is coming on to the platform where the young people are beginning to challenge the system. The only problem that we have, if it is a problem and a solution, is that when we fight these governments, when we remove them from power, what do we replace them with? Uh, the problem or the danger or this, the disadvantage would be to change hyenas with foxes. You remove one leader from power, and then you put another leader in the same democratic system. Long, young people, ladies and gentlemen, until we fully come to comprehension that the colonial democratic system will not work. Learn from Britain. Democracy will not work. Learn from United Arab Emirates. Democracy will not work. Learn from the Arab states. Democracy will not work. Learn from Singapore. Learn from China. Learn from North Korea. We needed to go back to find those indigenous governance systems. Call your elders in your cities, in your provinces, in your countries. Call your traditional elders together. Include women and include young people. Let them be a council that is above the government. The government must report to the people. The government must not be accountable to itself. The government must be accountable to the people. And the people must supervise the political system. Because this model of having minority in terms of parliamentarians ruling and governing the majority cannot work. A more representative form of governance as we used to have it in the olden days where the elders would sit together women would sit young people would sit rites of passages would be put in place and as we have already mentioned in another production that we did all governments all governments are illegitimate all governments are illegitimate because they are collecting taxes on the land that does not belong to them all African governments that have gone into power, they've gone into power and they've made themselves the kings of those land. And they're collecting taxes on a land that does not belong to them. In fact, we went to war to fight for the land. 
not to fight for democracy. We went to fight for the land. But unfortunately, the land and the system of indigenous governance systems was never returned. And the kings and the owners of the land were never given the land. Now the kings are actually paying taxes on their own land. When these businesses must be paying rent and taxes to the local indigenous leaders. Boom! And the best of them all was Orania in South Africa. Orania, there's a country in South Africa uh, called Orania where the Africaners, the white Africaners, have decided to create their own city, their own town, their own flag, their own currency and govern themselves. Why? They are preserving themselves, self-determination. They want to rule themselves. Blacks are not allowed to live there. Blacks are not allowed to work there. And this has become an exclusive place where only Africaners can live because they feel threatened that their culture is being eroded by the democracy. So if the Africaners are allowed to have their own country in a country, are allowed to run their own self-determination program in a country, the question is why must the Zulus not also be self-determining? Why must the Sutus, the Vendors, the Tongas, the, the, the Tswanas uh, also not do the same? Why must the African constantly be told of this concept of collective government, but the collective government is only benefiting a few? As such, the resources that are in the country need to be distributed fairly. And this comes to one of the statuses that I put, and I think some four years ago, the issue of decentralizing capital cities. Decentralizing capital cities. I'll take uh, Zimbabwe as an example. And I know that this uh, video will reach the powers that be, that we do not need to constantly be expanding capital cities. Because by expanding capital cities, you are putting the burden of the entire country on a city. These cities were not built to be lived by millions of Africans. They were built for a few white people and a few servants. So now when you have one, three, four million people sitting around the infrastructure of a city like Bulueyo or a city like Harare, the water becomes a problem, electricity becomes a problem, roads become a problem, hospitals become a problem. It is not that the services are poor, but they are overburdened. So here is my free advice to Honorable E.D. Mnangagwa. Take the Department of Tourism, the Department of Tourism, the whole office, move it from Harare to Victoria Falls. Let Victoria Falls have the Minister of Tourism at the place where tourism is happening. That will move away most of the tourism directors, their families, their children and everything. Huck, Victoria Falls. Move the Department of Economics, Business, Economic Affairs. Move it to Bulueyo. Because strategically speaking, Bulueyo is a junction. Good transport, infrastructure, railway lines, and proximity to Botswana, proximity to South Africa, proximity to Namibia, proximity to, to Zambia. And Bulueyo can actually become the financial hub, financial hub of Zimbabwe. Move then agriculture. Say to Mutare, the whole Department of Agriculture, move to Mutare. The Department of Education, move it to Gweru. Department of Mining and etc. Maybe move it to Kwekwe and etc. And then Department of um, you know, Research and uh, you know, move it to Chiredzi or somewhere there. You, you begin to see that when you move the departments away from the capital city, you are able to release the pressure on the city. And then you can leave Yarare as the capital city of your legal structures and parliament and etc. But then you'll, you'll have been able to distress the, 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 the infrastructure itself by moving these departments away. South Africa, Durban is for tourism, for example. And uh, Cape Town is where the parliament is happening. The Bloemfontein is uh, the judiciary capital. And Pretoria remains a state house and etc. By so doing, we are able to spread out spread out the resources of the country to the specific areas. The universities that are in these areas in Bulueyo, then you have your university that specializes in finance in Victoria Falls, universities that specialize in, uh, in, uh, in uh, hospitality, 
and then the Guero Kwekwe, do the education, the mining, the technologies, the mutare, and, and, and you, you just, you, you release the pressure, release the pressure, spread the cake, rather than collecting money from the whole country and feeding it into Harare. And at the end of the day, everyone, everyone begins to run to the capital city. The quicker we begin to spread these resources across the whole country, be it Botswana, be it Zambia, be it Zimbabwe, be it Malawi, avoid the capital city mentality. Because then you leave other parts of the country in a worse state, yet they are also contributing to the GDP. As such, it will be critical that when we want to deal with infrastructure development, we need to spread the infrastructure resources within the entire city, entire country, entire continent. And by so doing, I think we'll have been able to, to harness the energy of the young people to develop themselves where they are, to develop themselves where they are. And then you don't need to be running to Arare or running to Bulawayo because wherever you are, there is sufficient infrastructure that can actually help to develop. Then whoever the minister is of that department, where they are, with the chiefs that are there, set up a council there, then the council that reports maybe to the, to the higher government that is wherever, or the council of the elders. Then decentralize. We need to come up with a strategy to rework the model of leadership within Africa. We cannot have leaders who are being bribed by the West, bribed by the East, bribed by the North, and they come around here and they implement the principles of their colonial masters. They implement the, implement the principles of their handlers. And what do we end up having? We end up having stooges. Stooges that act like presidents and prime ministers. Meanwhile, they are taking instructions from the other powers that be. The young people of today are no longer as naive to be dealt with as if they are stupid. They are learned. They have studied. They have world trends. And they may have an understanding exactly as to what is happening in other countries. And we must also remember while we are doing that, we must preserve ourselves as Africans. We must preserve ourselves. If we are in a hurry to get into the global village, and yet we lack the moral, ethical, African Ubuntu fiber, we we'll still end up again as slaves in the very global market in which we are rushing to. With those few words, I wish to encourage the young people in Kenya that keep the struggle high. And as you are doing that, start thinking. Start thinking and combine the indigenous governance systems with a bit of the educated technological system. Find out for yourself a hybrid form of governance. You will have failed to push out Ruto from the office and then push another president, another prime minister into the same office who will be implementing the same laws, the same governance structures, the same Roman Dutch law that I've been preaching for the longest of time. That law is useless. It is misplaced. You cannot run Roman Dutch law in Africa. We are not Romans and we are not Dutch. We needed to start putting that between our ears. And the educated Africans, who when they look at me, they say, hey, my Ponga is going mad. My Ponga is going crazy. Don't worry. You will wake up one day. Time is with you. Don't worry. The more you study, the more you grow. You may just find that there is some sanity in my madness. Those that have made it in this world have found their own cultural vortex their own cultural roots. They found their purpose and reason for being. They found their identity. They found their culture. Look at China. Close out Facebook. Close out TikTok. Close out all these other things. Be selfish with the minds of your young people. Feed them with the information that will develop them to own, to respect, to be innovative, and to develop their own countries. And until we begin to combine the knowledge that we now have with the history that we are coming from, to come up with a hybrid sort of system that will take us out of this confusion and maze of neo-colonialism. We will constantly be talking that things are not changing. Yet things will not change until you and I change the way we think. Because we think that the white people have solutions for black people. It can't be that the very same people who abused us can come around and now they have a solution for us. They're not interested in Africa. They're interested in the resources of Africa. And these resources must be beneficiated on the ground. And when they beneficiate them, 
Where are they taking those resources to? Well, we need therefore to start understanding that the movement that we are now having, the rising up and the saging of the African spirits, it's almost like our ancestors are coming back alive and well. Alive and well. And we're going to be starting up a movement in Zimbabwe in the next few weeks for the returning of the of the skulls of our ancestors who uh, had their heads were chopped and they were moved over into, into Britain just for a decent funeral. We're not asking for anything much more than that. And uh, it is important that as Africans, we begin to look at new models of governance for ourselves and for our children. Be selfish about your economy. Own your economy. Own your banks. Own your insurance companies. Own your academic curriculums. Own your hospitals. Own your pharmaceuticals. Invest your money in your own selves and develop products for yourselves. And let's build the Africa that we want. One Africa, one passport, one army, one foreign exchange, one currency, one central bank, one army. We protect our borders and all our countries are provinces, are provinces, our provinces. And the problem we have is not the people. The problem are our leaders who are now worried if we join and we make Africa one, what will I be? I will lose being a president. I mean, even if now you're a president, what are we benefiting from your presidents? You can still work as a governor. You can still work as a leader. You can still work as a provincial leader. So we needed to start thinking strategically. How can we have one seat at the Security Council? And that is for ourselves to be together, to unite as Africans. And once we are united with the 1.4, 1.5, billion people that are walking on the expanse of this continent, we can begin to have a voice that is audible. And our resources are sufficient enough to sponsor that agenda and create the Africa that we owe it to our children. Before we go, we owe it to our children to leave for them a united continent. 54 African presidents failed to undo what 10, 15 people, white people did in the Berlin conference. Took a pen and paper and drew maps through the dining rooms of other people and cut up the country. 54 leaders failed to come together to undo what 10 white people did. And then you say you are in power. I don't call that power. You are in power, but you are not in control. What is important is for us to begin to talk the reality of African unity. And African unity will come when each country begins to develop itself and not be selfish as African political leaders to eat the resources only to ourselves. Let's share the resources with everybody. Create the Africa that is safe for us and for our children. With those few words, I want to thank you all for the time that you give me and the support that you constantly give to Farmers of Thought right here on your afternoon drive, live with Maponga J. Live with Maponga J broadcasting for you from, uh, from Mutare. Uh, think well, Nube, my own brother, the Nube, I'm also, I'm also a Nube. He says, I disagree with you on this one. Uh, you are in, I disagree in some topics, but uh, this one, you are indeed on point. Oh, sorry, I did not read it correctly. Oh, thank you very much for the support. Uh, Tapuwa Mtseriwa, keep up the good work, Mzukuru. Yes, I am also with you. That um, Tapuwa Matesha, pleasure to see you. King Aura, Black Power, keep preaching the truth about Africa. You are going to go mad slowly, Vuzijena. Uh, Chris Penn is advising me. And how do you say that your own brother? And you go around public places now telling that your own brother is going mad. Uh, preach, my brother. We are watching you from Zambia. Keep up the good work. I've managed to read a few comments here. Mlongo, Sitali, Brian Michello, Glenn V. Thomas. Well, thank you for joining us. And King Power. Secheni, uh, Rebecca, Seho, Luana, Seho Luana, right in South Africa here. Yeah, thank you for watching also. Mugove, do, do chemoyo, boginko, sikunene. I respect you so much, Baba. We need, you are needed uh, to deliver Africa. Keep on the good work, Mfundisi. Chiso, Maononga. Thank you for joining us also. Teacher, quant, powerful and uh, good work. What is your take on what is currently happening in Congo? Evil. It's evil to the highest order. 
and I think the concept of coming up with one African army will actually help us to solve some of these problems. Because through one army, we can simply silence the guns in, in Congo. And Congo has enough water, enough resources for the rest of Africa. And uh, it's very convenient for the Western world to keep Congo at war. Because the liberation of Congo means the unleashing of the greatest amount of resources which are being abused by the East and the West. So, and I think maybe uh, on another week or so, I could focus a whole program on Congo. That has been one of the longest wars that are being fought in Africa, you know, from Belgium to now. The bullet, there's no single day that goes out in Congo and there's no gunshot there. I think maybe let me uh, stop there and I might want to do a program specifically looking at Congo. Uh, the message uh, I've been preaching is now getting there. Yes, slowly but surely, slowly but surely, you have me for this generation. I will shout until it gets there. I will look like I'm going mad, I'm going crazy, like I'm losing my marbles. Don't worry about me, don't worry about me. I have been sent to you to constantly share the message of unity development for the African continent and until that is achieved my life I'll put it on the block to deliver to that. Sipiwe, Liveni uh, please cover uh, that topic when you have time my father I'll do that, I'll do the Congo program uh, Gen Z in Kenya, viva viva in Kenya, yes I've already mentioned it, when you remove Ruto don't replace with another president find another solution now that you've destroyed the parliament build the traditional one call the elders together and start mapping up a new. We are learning from you. And we are taking notes. So do whatever you are doing and do it well. Uh, Gen, Z, Gen Z. Gen Z. We are watching very carefully. And taking notes also. To see how we can also take the power back to the people. And restore the dignity of the African people. We are tired of African leaders. Who are abusive towards Africans. And they are enjoying resources for themselves. This land belongs to us. And our children. I would also want to beg you to explain about the Christianity beginning in Egypt and Arabs. I've done lots of programs on Christianity. You can go on my YouTube channel and etc. Interviews. I think I have hundreds of videos that are there on the concept of Christianity and etc. I think you will still be able to find yourself there. Are you still a believer? Uh, Boss Wish is asking me. Man, I don't need to believe in anything. I just, just ask me, am I alive? And I'm alive and I'm doing very well. Very well. You can only believe in what you don't know. So if you know it, you don't need to believe in it. And with those few words, I thank you. Yours truly, Maponga G. Chigaramboko, Gorama Shamba Huda. Chiranawa Nwe Wanji. Magume Mwana Nwe Sindewe Shano. Sibuye Sutiza Zuna Kwekwa Nwana Mwana Pedo Ntamba Nwana. Ntamba Ruparu Wariba Nwana Makaramba Kuri Mwakari Mwana Chema Newe. Nwana Shamba Nwe Gore. Sibuye Sutiza Zuna Kwekwa Nwana Mwana. Ah, I'm so happy to be with you. And we will be seeing again. Until we meet again, don't do what I wouldn't do. But if you do it, 